So thank you all so much for being here. The concept of waste-led design has been coined by uh, Slow Factory. Our chief innovation officer came up with that terminology, which means essentially looking at the end of life of an item, of an object, of a process first, before we begin designing for functionality or aesthetics. Even as we are designing systems, we want to look at the end of life of that very system or how the system is managing waste at every single level of its creation. So during this class, we will explore waste-led design, which is an approach that considers the end of life of materials at the beginning of the design process. We will also talk about how to implement circular design methodology and adopt sustainability thinking methods within product design process in order to reduce the burden placed on landfills by overconsumption and waste and how to redistribute this responsibility. So we're going to start by looking at what is open education and creative commons because I think that's a very important uh, topic to discuss because this is what we're doing here. We are sharing open education. We're going to also address linear systems. We're going to look at waste as a new resource and the life cycle assessment. How do we calculate the life cycle of an object? And then at the end, we're going to look at Landfill as Museum, which is the program uh, under which this class has been designed. Exciting. Let's get started. So open education. Open education is about transparency, open ethics or ethics, collaboration, traceability, and accessibility. And open education exists without necessarily the academic institution behind it. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer knowledge system that continuously changes and evolves. It is a, a, a more forgiving framework, if you will, because it allows for trial and error. And it also builds a knowledge system that is outside of an institution that's much more democratic. And my work, the work that we do here at Slow Factory, our work is under Creative Commons. Creative Commons, for those of you who don't know what it is, is basically the gray area between copyright and public domain. And it's this gray area that allows creators, educators, thinkers to share their work outside of the copyrighted institution and allows for others to build upon the work. There are some base rules. Uh, our work is designed under Creative Commons, uh, non-commercial, which means you cannot take the work and sell it as your own or even tweak it and sell it. This is uh, meant to remain in the open education, free education framework, but you can take the work and build upon it as long as you attribute the work to the source, just as we do here at Slow Factory. So let's explore linear systems. But before we do, I want to take you with me to the landfill. So this is what it looks like being on the landfill. You know, we're walking on piles and piles of garbage, things that we've used that very day, like a yogurt or a toothbrush or cottage cheese, even though I'm vegan, I don't eat that, but probably you have. take design students to the landfill. There's our everyday objects right here. Right there. Everything we've used. A can of soda. No, I don't drink soda, but I do drink La Croix, for those of you who know. I do wash my clothes. Do you wash your clothes with detergent bottles? Raise your hands if you do. Now you understand how it feels to be on a landfill. Before the landfill as museums, we ask people, how does a landfill make you feel? 
And a lot of people said sad, angry, indifferent, curious, but sad and angry were what we got the most answers of. So sad and angry. So when you think of a landfill, how do you feel? How does that make you feel? How does a landfill make you feel? And so we want to answer, why do things end up in a landfill? Why didn't we design a better system yet? Because sadly, our life exists in a linear system. And this is adopted by, you know, the framework of European philosophies that we are born, we live, and then we die. And this is how we produce things. We create something, we use it, and we discard it. And it goes into this unknown place that is the landfill, essentially. So we have material extraction, manufacturing, product assembly, packaging and distribution, we have oftentimes designed a way for the usage part to be as small as possible so that there's disposal and end of life happening very quickly after we have adopted the product. And the reason why in that time frame it's such a short time frame for usage and disposal is because for the economic model to be prosperous, for capitalism to exist, we need to redo this whole loop back again as fast as possible, as often as possible. But as we are relying on material extraction heavily in order to create this linear system, we are depleting our planet at an alarming rate. And at the same time, we're creating so much waste at also an alarming rate without even using that waste as part of our linear system. So according to Housing Works, 40% of the clothing donations that, we, that people give end up in thrift stores, only 40%, but 60% of them end up nowhere, but let's see where. So only 40% are washed, organized, and resold in thrift stores, which is a great amount, but what happens to the 60%? Let's take a look at the global secondhand clothing industry that is worth $3.7 billion. So that's why there's a lot of startups around the secondhand industry. You know, the, the OGs were eBay, you know, they immediately understood the need that we needed to create a system for us to capture the secondhand economy and create something around it. And then you have the thrift stores, you know, of course the thrift stores are the OGs before eBay, but eBay allowed everyone else around the world to be able to share and sell independently their unwanted goods. But if we were to trace where the donations are going and how the economy of donations work, we're going to see here, this is the, sor the source for this slide is the BBC News and it's capturing which countries import, export, used clothing, and it's from 2016, so it's already four years old. But we are looking here at where our donated items go and how do they end up there. And essentially, the donated items are being sold, okay, and are being donated to these countries, and then the burden ends up on these countries to figure out what to do with those donated items. Well, we're going to look at Ghana together because we were able to work with an organization called the Or is Present, and their project is called Dead White Men's Clothes. And if you want to learn more about it, I encourage you guys to go to the Or is Present and to Google all that Dead White Men's Clothes because there's a brand that's called Dead White Men's Clothes. So you have to Google this entire sentence to end up in the right direction where um, the or is present is basically documenting the work that they're doing in Ghana. The or is present is uh, it's a non for profit it's US based it's co founded by Liz Ricketts and Brandon Skinner and together they went to Ghana and they started working there in 2011 and 2009 for Liz. They wanted to trace out where the donations in the US are going where are they going in um, in which countries and what happens to them once they end up there. And what they found is an entire economy around the donated clothes. So part of the economy, there are human beings that, that benefit and or are basically trapped in that system and 
find themselves working within a system because they have no other choice. We're going to focus here on the Kayeye, who are the women who carry the clothes on their heads and who suffer from this weight of this clothes on their bodies. So they have neck issues, back issues, you know, fractured ankles because they have to, you know, basically run back and forth carrying these piles and piles of clothes because they're paid per clothes that they are able to move. And they're paid very little money to be able to carry these clothes. So it goes as fast as possible for them to be able to create uh, a living wage. So they, they are paid 30 cents for carrying each bale of clothes, which is about 120 pounds for kilometers and kil miles and miles for them to be able to walk really, really fast to be able to uh, deliver these clothes. And so the ore is present and dead white men's clothes are basically a non-for-profit that caters and supports and protects the Kayeye and advocates for them. And during COVID, you can only imagine the amount of work that they had to do remotely uh, for, to protect women that are um, at risk. So at the end of the day, around this linear system, we see a lot of efforts in trying to create closed loop systems, which are these markets and these markets, women and girls are working within these markets in order to move the donated clothes and create a market around these donated clothes so that they can survive because these donated clothes are crowding and overwhelming their markets, the markets of the Ghanaian people, and they aren't basically helping anyone. So it becomes a massive waste management around textile. So how do we solve this problem? So this is a design question. And I want you guys to write that down because this is what this class hopes to achieve, at least tries to create, a, if you want, a beginning of curiosity, of, of interest around waste. So let's look at waste as a resource. So what we hope to achieve here, I don't know if I move my box here, if you could see the Venn diagram that we are cre creating. At Slow Factory, we always work at the intersection of human rights and environmental responsibility. We want to look at a holistic approach that looks at both the human lives, the Kayeye, and waste, for instance. So for example, in this context, and I want you guys to draw this Venn diagram and to look at it from this angle, when you are approaching the question that we asked in the previous slide, how do we solve the problem? We solve the problem by adopting a holistic approach, period. We can't solve the problem. And I was very surprised yesterday, I was talking to uh, a new peer that I, that I met in the space of, um, of plastic pollution. And I was surprised to see that, you know, despite the Black Lives Matter movement and this big uprising that we've seen since 2013, 2020, we continue to see the efforts uh, led by Black women and Black folks around the need to look at all of these problems from a holistic perspective. Environmental issues are racial justice issues. But I was surprised to see that today, in the end of 2020, after this crazy year behind us, that you know the efforts are oftentimes only superficial or performative are only demonstrated on an Instagram grid because when we look at a problem from a holistic approach from both a human rights and a, an environmental responsibility, this also means that we need to be including black, brown and indigenous folks in the, in the research and the development of these solutions at the very beginning of the problem. And I was surprised to see that this was not taken into consideration by this large organization and I was feeling a little sad because I was like, oh my goodness, the inclusion and the need to, to, to do so will benefit our humanity. This is not just to look good or to look like you are not a racist. This is what we need to work on collectively right now and to open up and to branch out our systems to include Black, Brown and Indigenous folks into our research around plastic, our research around waste, otherwise, we are continuing to perpetuate this linear system, this siloed system, the separation between human rights and environmental justice. And until we work at this intersection only, we will be able to find solutions that are good for all, all of our humanity. 
So that's from where we're going to begin this work and this inquiry. So with a sustainable circular system, we can do less extraction and create less waste. Less extraction, less waste. This is where we want to achieve. This is the system that we wish to achieve. So minimal waste, minimum extraction, maximum usage, and maximum waste to resource. That's not what we have today, by the way. This is the ideal framework. This is where we want to go. So let us look at waste as a new resource. What is waste-led design? Waste-led design is a new circular approach that prioritizes waste as a core part of the design process. What's the difference between that and the circular economy? I, I get that question all the time. So my answer, personally, the circular economy doesn't produce any waste. Waste-led design utilizes ex existing frame, okay. The answer that we have here at, at the Slow Factory is that one is looking at a design approach and the other is looking at maintaining the status quo around the economy and the economic models that we have currently. That's one of the answers. This is what, what differentiates waste-led design from the circular economy. The second point is that throughout the waste-led design system framework and definition and work in progress, we center black, brown, and indigenous minority ethnic thinkers, scholars, designers, philosophies, in order for us to create effectively a holistic system because waste-led design basically is an indigenous wisdom because there isn't any waste if you want to design it this way. Waste is just a design issue, is the way we design waste. But what we call waste was never waste. There isn't any waste. When we look at nature and how nature functions around what we call waste, there isn't any waste. Nothing is actually wasted. Everything is reused. And ancient wisdom and indigenous wisdom, indigenous knowledge, Eastern philosophies have observed the same and have concluded similarly to how nature functions that there isn't such thing as waste. Waste is a colonial construct. So waste-led design systems, here we go. This is an ideal framework, by the way. This does not exist, okay? <laughs> or if it does exist, it exists in a microsystem or a macrocosm that was able to achieve this. And we have examples of these microsystems that do exist. And it's important. We're not going to be snobbing microsystems. We're not going to snob the small uh, in order to just acknowledge the huge, the big, because that is also a colonial construct. If that system can exist at a microcosm, at a micro level, it can exist at a macro level. It can be multiplied and duplicated. In the program that we run here at the Slow Factory called One by One, which is the first science incubator in the fashion industry, we champion these small systems at a micro level. It's important when we are looking at innovation at scale to start small and make sure that our innovation works at a micro system in a small uh, system. And if it works in a smaller system, it can work in a macro system. When we go back to our landfill, there are elements of the circular system here that are used within the linear system. So at first, when we embarked on this journey, we were imagining that this linear system needed to be completely twisted and bended to create a circular one. Imagine bending a very, very, very rigid pipe. And that's how I felt personally when I embarked on this journey 10 years ago. I got really tired and also you can create some severe back pain from trying to bend that linear system. And that is only when I realized that, you know, perfection is the enemy of progress. It's not true that until we have a circular system, a perfectly circular system that we would achieve, uh, you know, in uh, climate positive solutions. Climate positive solutions and circularity happen at every single level of this linear system. And they kind of erode it and create a natural way for it to bend and create its, uh, the circular system that we're trying to create. So I want to invite you <laughs> to look at this pipe, okay? This pipe is on a landfill. This, this grass that you see here is what covers a closed landfill, a finished landfill. It, it, it maxed out, it cannot take any more waste. So when it maxes out, 
you know, in the in 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 uh, developing countries and in the global north, because in the global south we don't have that technology. But in the global north, they cover it up with grass. And what they do here in America, they basically absorb all the methane that the waste is creating and control the methane uh, emission, and capturing it with this thing here, this pipe, helps them to create. Guess what? Electricity. Yes, you heard it here. Electricity. <laughs> so when they capture the methane with this pipe, all the methane that be, that is being emanates from this waste, this waste here, buried, very deep under the landfill. So this is the anatomy of a landfill. If you're curious to learn more about this, go to the Slow Factory website, slowfactory.foundation, click on the hamburger menu, click on landfill as museums, and you're going to find this this wonderful illustration by Yasmin Ahram, who is our lead designer here at Slow Factory. So this pipe is absorbing the methane, the methane extraction that's produced by this waste and is turning it into electricity. And they, they, they create so much electricity that they sell it back to the grid. So if we manage landfills properly, we could extract methane that can be in, turned into electricity and that's a circular system, guys. That's a circular design system. That is circularity alongside the linear massive system that exists already. So let's not be despaired. Oh, we cannot do anything about this. We can, we can, and at every single level. So that is how we, uh, we create waste-led design at every single level. Don't be purist, guys. Don't be all or nothing. That's the enemy of progress. And that's the colonial construct. Life cycle assessment. Life cycle assessment is a method used to quantify the environmental impact of a product from raw material to acquisition through end of life disposal, usually used to inform strategies for reducing the environmental footprint. The life cycle analysis or LCA for short can provide critical information such as carbon footprint, energy required to create it, toxic emissions, and the amount of water used at every step of an object's life cycle. So it's puzzle pieces from material extraction to manufacturing, product assembly, packaging and distribution, usage, disposal, and end of life. Every single step is calculated. Let's quiz you a little bit. Oh, I hit my funny bones on my chair. Okay, um, <laughs> as I recover, please tell me which of these bags is more sustainable. Okay, if you've done my class before, you probably know the answer. But if you have not, which of these bags is more sustainable? The plastic bag, the paper bag, or the tote bag? cotton bag. It's a cotton bag, okay? So we're going to analyze that in an LCA shortly. So everybody's saying the tote cotton bag. Let's see about that. Mm -hmm. So if we calculate just the carbon footprint of one bag, carbon emissions, the plastic bag, 3.48 pounds of carbon emissions. The paper bag, basically, Trees, remember, paper is made out of trees. 12.18 pounds of carbon emission, the carbon footprint of this bag. The tote bag, 598.6 pounds of carbon emissions to manufacture, grow the cotton, produce, import, export this bag into your hands. Let's look at the water usage. Water footprint per bag. Plastic bag, 580 gallons of water. That's a lot of water. Paper bag, 10,000 gallons of water that could have been used. The cotton bag, 20,000 gallons of <laughs> water, guys. <sighs> It's a lot of water. I'm not sure that's the most sustainable bag. If you ask me, based on this data, okay, now let's look at the usage of one bag 
to break even with the environmental impact of a plastic bag. So if you use the bag once, the plastic bag once, you will be able to basically break even with its carbon emission. The paper bag needs to be used four times in order to break even with its carbon emissions. The cotton bag, you need to use it 172 times in order for each bag to break even with its carbon and with its life cycle assessment, with its, with its impact on the environment to break even. So I want you to tell me in, your, in the chat, how many cotton tote bags you guys own in the house? I'm sure you own a lot of cotton tote bags. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Five to 10, 20, 29, what? Guys, 29 times 172, start using those bags. Stop purchasing tote bags is the, <laughs> the call to action. 40, who has 40 tote bags? Me too, probably. But isn't that fascinating, guys? Isn't that fascinating? In the long term, waste makes a difference, right? In the long run of all of this, waste makes a difference. So we have a tote bag on one end that is lighter than all of these plastic bags that are being produced and used only once. So in the end, you were right. The tote bag is the most sustainable, but on the long term, only if we introduce the notion of time. Because if we were to live in the moment, the plastic bag is the least, has the least uh, environmental damage. So only 1% of plastic bags get recycled, while the rest end up deeply disturbing the ecosystems of our oceans, our forests, and never decompose. So this is something that I just want to put out there that, you know, plastic does not decompose. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller into what we call microplastics. Microplastics are what our polyester garments emit when we wash them and they end up into the ocean. And today in the ocean on planet Earth, we have more microplastics than we have stars in our galaxy. Conclusion. First, when we are talking about these conclusions, we need to address that these conclusions were made thousands of years ago by indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom, and it's called the seventh generation principle. It's based on an ancient Iroquois philosophy that the decisions we make today should result in a sustainable world for seven generations into the future. So reuse your bags, mend them, and upcycle. Landfill as museums. So Landfill as Museums is a program we started here at Slow Factory. It's part of the open education framework that, we've, that we are part of. It's an open learning initiative, which means we are not you know, basically teaching like this linearly. We bring students to the landfills and we allow them to create their own conclusions. And as they walk on these piles and piles of garbage that I showed you in the beginning of this class, something happens in their, in their perception. There's a cognitive shift that changes their approach to waste. And when we surveyed them at the end of the landfill as museums, and we said, how does a landfill make you feel? A lot of them replied hopeful, excited about opportunities. And they, they kind of changed their, their perception around waste and the stigmatization around waste that we, that we share collectively. So let's look at it together. <laughs> things going. Trash, it's a necessary byproduct of our existence. Our 
I pretty much consider a landfill this like chaotic, sort of just dump, unorganized, smelling, apocalyptic. <laughs> you know, you're walking on piles and mountains and you recognize the things across the field. But there's a lot of environmental activism there that I think was shocking for everybody. I think one of the biggest myths is that landfills are just big holes in the ground. The materials get dumped into that might have been true ages ago, but a modern landfill is really an engineering marvel. Three generations grew up on this property, uh, working here, living here. My grandfather grew up digging the lakes, and then my father worked on the farms that were located here. And then subsequently we came in and started working on the landfill We're on the same piece of property. So we're working on our fourth landfill since I've been here. Through technology and reuse or recycle, I'd be happy not to build any more of these. Landfills as museum is a way for us to start meditating on the end of life of products. Good afternoon, sir. Is it today's store? It is today's store. Yeah. How are you doing? We still have people that feel that these operations are, are leftovers from the 50s where there's no technology, there's no environmental controls in place, but people come out for a tour, they're just overwhelmed and wowed by the advances that we've made in managing the waste over the years. And a lot of folks sort of probably uh, perceive us as being sort of the bad guy that we're just missed for profit, but, but we're not. Students that are enrolling in design programs in fashion before they start imagining new products, they have to be able to imagine life cycle assessments from a point of view that is a lived experience. So someone ate some fries, there's grease and there's ketchup, and so this will never get recycled. They thought of environmentalism at the front end and don't buy this, but I don't think they realized how much environmentalism comes at the end of life through organizations like waste management and how much of a feat of engineering it is. We are one of the largest recyclers in the country, if not the largest recycler in the country. I left with the sort of amazement of how productive they actually are. The car goes to be recycled. This is all the interior foam products and, and plastics and stuff that's not recyclable. We actually bring it back to the landfill. This is a good material for the trucks to be able to drive through because it can absorb the rainwater and the trucks can still get through it and drive through it. I didn't even know that they produced you know, energy that went back into the grid. That was so cool. I just expected to see a bunch of steamy, like wet, you know, garbage. And I was so pleasantly surprised to see how beautiful, honestly, it was and like how well it's maintained. There are things that we do really well, but there are some parts that we need help on. And so this is a perfect time to be working with fashion designers, textile designers, to rethink about how garments are being designed so that by the time they get to us, we know that there are some other options for them that can extend the life and reduce the environmental impact of that garment. So if we could do something up front in the design, that's going to make it easier for a company like ours to reuse that product and get it back into market. I think it's important for corporations to understand where the products end up. Us, big companies, we have the power and responsibility to change things. Waste management mentioned there were 600 trucks that dumped a load just in that one day. It sort of you know, reaffirms that trying to design things to stay out of the landfill is sort of the most important thing. These students are the future. They're the ones who care. They're the ones who are mad about the state of the world they were born into. I feel that we had a number of students that were volunteering their own time to be there to learn about circular systems so that they can create. And that connection is really what we need. It's up to the younger generation who's coming up with these uh, new technologies that maybe you can help. You know, fashion is very attractive. It's glamorous. Everyone wants to design a beautiful collection, but it's an actual product. Consider the lifespan, especially, and where you want your garment to be in 50 years. As a designer, I commit to mindful design and mindful appropriation of material. Each person plays a role in making it successful. I think there's this thought that, well, just put it in the can, sort of out of sight, out of mind, instead of realizing that every purchasing decision that you make has an impact. And I feel like it just made me like think beyond the fashion industry. Being involved in something like this is so important because it just teaches you like how to build a better relationship with the waste. We need to observe waste as a new resource and we have to think of waste as an asset. This has to stop becoming a polarized issue and a political issue and start to become a human issue.
Thank you everyone for sticking to the very end of this amazing class. Let's get to the questions. Are these items in the landfill diverted somehow from recycling system? Okay, so one thing that we're gonna look into, I wanna encourage you to look at wish cycling. Okay, and we have a definition on the Slow Factory um, Instagram account. And we're gonna, of course, include some of the glossary that we've explored here together. Wish cycling is essentially the idea the idea that we are putting things in a recycle bin and wishing that they would be recycled. And uh, sadly, that doesn't happen because if the, 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 the objects in the recycling bin have been contaminated with either food waste or oil, then they can't be recycled. So that's why they end up in, in the landfill, as you saw. Could you explain why waste is a colonial concept phenomenon? Wouldn't it be more based on class? By this, I mean my grandmothers grew up imp impoverished like most people around them and had circularity low waste in mind due to scarcity. Speaking from Southern Portugal. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. No, it's not a, a class issue, sadly. It is a colonial issue because we're looking at a systemic issue that does not just impact you know, people who have less money or people who live in underserved communities. It impacts them most, I agree with you, but it does not just impact them and they aren't only the ones learning how to live in circular ways. Waste is a global issue. It is a systemic issue that has been designed to be this way and has been enforced by colonial colonialism uh, because this linear system that exists, and I would encourage you to take the other classes that were part of the first module before open education under sustainability literacy that are on the website at the Slow Factory. And uh, you can access them with, let me just get you this link. And it's valid for all of you guys. If you are curious, I answer that question in this the class sustainability literacy crash courses and uh, they are available here and the password is slow down all lowercase and you can take all the classes and I really walk you through this uh, this understanding of why waste is a colonial construct are there tools to do footwear LCA or is it something one needs to ask for consultancy Yes, you do need to have a third party assessing the LCA. Otherwise, there will be so much corruption in determining your own LCA. Of course, you can have your teams, you know, calculate the LCA. But in order for you to go public on the life cycle analysis, you need a third party to verify that your calculations and the way that you've calculated things are in fact correct. So um, yes, it's it's a whole field of study, and uh, and I would encourage you guys to look deeper into it. If you work within footwear, um, it's definitely beneficial to hire consultants that specialize in calculating land, uh, LCA. What is the best way for new small sustainable clothing brands to adopt a zero waste design into their business? Oh, I feel like that should be a class on its own. Yes, a class on that would be amazing. I agree. I mean, very quickly, it would be to analyze the waste that you have uh, across your supply chain and to find ways to create, uh, to reuse, to upcycle along the way. That's the, the quick and easy answer. What are your thoughts on bioplastics, biodegradable plastics? Companies often fail to disclose they're not compostable at home, only in industrial centers. So is this a step toward a better design system? That's a great question. Thank you, Rita, again. You know, there isn't such thing as recycled, like biodegradable plastic. If it is a material that mimics plastic and that is biodegradable, there needs to be a fair amount of information disclosed on how that item can be biodegraded or uh, where, where should a consumer put it in order for it to biodegrade in an efficient way. And I agree with you, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding around biodegradability and compostable and a class on that would be great, <laughs> but definitely, um, there, you know, we can't say that 
plastic is biodegradable. That's just not the case. We saw it. It's just going to be broken down into smaller and smaller particle of plastic. So um, there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding about all of that and a lot of misinformation about what do we do with that said biodegradable plastic? How can we gently hold them accountable? Why gently? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But you can start a conversation with these brands and, and understand that probably the brands also don't know. They need to ask the manufacturers of these plastic bags uh, more questions. And um, uh, yes, there is an opportunity for learning more uh, in that space, definitely. How do you reconcile using plastic bags than tote? How do you reconcile using plastic bags than tote when culture is now built on using a reusable bag for groceries and the waste associated with it? I'm not sure I understand the question, Brendan. Maybe you want to use the chat and help me understand. I mean, if you have a, a, a tote bag, the point is that you need to reuse that tote bag again and again and again and again in order for it to break even with, it, with its environmental impact. Uh, that it that it was caused to create a virgin uh, cotton tote bag. It's not like upcycled. It's not made with existing cotton. So um, the point is to reuse those bags as much as possible instead of buying new tote bags or, you know, just creating new tote bags. Someone says, and it's a great one, Karina. If you have enough plastic bags. There are many crochet and knit patterns to make an upcycled tote bag with the existing plastic bag. And a class on that would be amazing. I hope my team is writing, taking notes on all these amazing classes we could be developing on. Brendan here says, your graph reinforced the use of a plastic bag just was pointing out to use it mm -hmm, over and over. I mean, it's not pointing out that... Again, there were other slides after that, Brandon, that showed that when you introduce the notion of time, uh, it's not true that the plastic bag is the least impactful on the environment, right? Because the, the, at the rhythm at which we are using these plastic bags uh, on the scale of time, that's what creates the damage that we are seeing because the plastic bags are being emitted into the environment as waste and they clog up the systems, the fish eat them, et cetera, et cetera. So the conclusion was to reuse the, the, the cotton bags and the plastic bags and the paper bags as much as possible. Devon Rufo says, I've been reading a lot about creating a circular fashion industry thanks to your social course and recommendations and become increasingly disheartened by the challenge of consumption rates. We can and must do the most to create circular systems of production and consumption, but how do we shift consumption habits away from accumulating so much stuff? Or is that thinking too much about things we can't control? That's a great question, Devon. And I would encourage everyone to think about sustainability as a culture. And if you are curious about that and want to hear others thinking about that, please go to the study hall on the slowfactory.foundation. If you click on the hamburger menu, click on study hall and the study hall that we did in London was called sustainability as a culture. Actually, I'm gonna link it here for you guys. And it's a great uh, study hall to, to look into. There's so much information there and a lot of people are thinking about this and it's a, it's a great question and it is about culture. It's about changing culture. Is waste-led design oriented mostly at closing the loop and turn existing waste into an input, I guess you're trying to say, or an asset? Or is it also focused on reimagining design so that it reduces the generation of waste as a resource? For example, not adding antimony in polyester so that it can be recycled a lot more without actually losing quality each time it is recycled. Yes and yes, absolutely. It is about both of these things. It's about designing a system that is, that's favorable for closed loop systems. It's also about looking at the immediate issues that we have. And it's also looking at materials and how materials are being made in order for them to not, to not be toxic as they are being uh, emitted into the environment. So yes, it's a holistic approach as I explained in the beginning and definitely looking at both systems, product and immediate issues. What about landfills not in the US or in the global South? 
Philippa, that's a great question. Uh, because of COVID-19, our landfill as museums was uh, put on a, on a halt this year. Uh, we had plans to going into Ghana with the ore is present in, the, in Vietnam and uh, in Lebanon, where I'm from. And hopefully we are looking at expanding landfills as museums in the global south next year. The reason why we started here in New York was because we were curious to looking at the technology that glo the global north had around landfills because we are interested in seeing what could it look like if the global south was empowered, funded and supported by the global north to take care of the waste that the global north is sending to the global south, what would it look like? And so that's why we started here. But yes, yeah, stay tuned next year, we are going to be expanding this program. Advice on sustainable ways to clean out our closets. Clothing swaps and flea markets are great options, but what if you still have items left over? That's a great question, uh, Nirvana. And definitely, you know, the items that you have left over are they going to be used by others? That's the first question. Do they have a second life in the market? And if they don't have a second life in the market, could they be used um, in a recycling facility, for instance, in stuffing um, mattresses and stuffing couches in stuffing pillows and so on and so forth? And if that's their end of life, then please inquire into disposing of them in the correct facility. What is the best way to dispose of trash? I reuse plastic bags when I have them, but if I completely use my tote bags, I'm not sure what to do with what can't be composted. Can we put that waste directly into garbage cans? I mean, yes, you can. And, and as you could see, the idea is, it, it is to redistribute responsibility at every level, from design to usage to disposing this garbage. So it does not just rely on the shoulder of the public. If you have some questions and maybe some solutions, maybe reach out to your elected officials in your city and see what they can do on a city level because these issues are not just your issues. They're a collective issues. Learn how to organize with your peers and create systems that are good for your community. Any ideas on how to implement the same cycle way of thinking into the built environment and urban development? Yes, Kelsey, that's a great question. I mean, we can apply waste-led design to pretty much everything, whether we are building a building or we are creating a school or we are designing an object. It is a holistic approach and it's a, a very open approach that can be applied to pretty much everything. Is there any consideration for already existing waste in landfills in the design process, or is it more thinking about future products? There is a consideration, but there is a sanitary issue and a health hazard issue that you would have to overcome by discussing with your local waste management uh, into seeing there's so much scrap that waste management keeps. So definitely there is an opportunity. There's an opportunity also in collecting waste before it lands into the waste management hands, depending where you are. If you are interested in that type of upcycling, there needs to be a collaboration at that level with a, you know, a collection agency that uh, not a collection of money, but like someone who collects garbage that is able to help you uh, sort before it ends up in the landfill. Once in, it's in a landfill, there's a health hazard issue. What do you think about the idea of asking designers for their dead stock to create new collections? I think that's a genius idea. Uh, we do that at Slow Factory all the time. It's been years that we've been asking for these dead stocks. Uh, there's a lot of politics around that, a lot of uh, legal issues as well. They don't want their brand necessarily to be resold. So. Yeah, that's a great problem to solve. I'm curious to see how you solve it, Christina. How do we change our day-to-day -to, -day to not create more waste given the current state of the fashion industry? This is an individual issue. It is a collective issue. It is a systemic issue. There are issues at every level. And I'm curious to see how you are able to identify these issues and create solutions at every single level. That's not, there's no one blanket solution for, uh, for these, these questions. 
How do we make the Global North lobby for policy change more rigorously so that more waste is not dumped into the Global South? That's a great question. That's a great question. That is a startup or a business or a non-for-profit or an initiative. Go for it. Lobby, create policies, create laws. It is a cultural issue. Raise awareness. Absolutely. Oshala, I hope I'm pronouncing your name okay, but do it. That is a great initiative. We need more people at that level doing that type of work. You know, it's a cultural issue. It's a systemic issue. It's a design issue. It's a collective issue. It's an individual issue. We have it at every level. So address it at all of these levels. That's, that's the call to action. I understand from wish cycling that contaminating things cannot be recycled and get dumped, in, get dumped into the landfill. However, from the waste that are clean and can be recycled in the United States, are they even getting recycled? So this is an issue that needs to be distributed between the, the, the brand that produces this item and the consumer that chooses to purchase this item. There has been so much lobby in the United States to include the little triangles underneath the products. I don't have an actual product, but let's pretend this is one. There's these three triangle, like the triangle of arrows that says that, yes, this is recyclable on, on plastic items, when in fact they aren't recyclable. So it's not waste management's issue. It is the brand that continues to use this material and continues to lie to their consumers that this item is recyclable. And although you are washing it, wasting water on it, it isn't recyclable at the end of the day. So do inquire on that, create pressure on the brands that continue to use these types of materials, these types of plastics, and encourage the brands that you love to look into re reusable um, packaging. Uh, because that's that's how it was before, you know. Encourage them to take back the products that they're emitting into the environment. Okay, one last question. I'm gonna go randomly. Here we go. How can we better encourage young designers to care more about sustainable practices? There are students who already are genuinely concerned, but still, for the most part. Most fashion students still work off the linear life cycle. Thank you, great class. Thank you, great question, Celeste. I think that what we are doing here is trying to encourage young designers. Uh, we are also addressing designers who work in large, larger brands to take on these classes, to work closely with the Slow Factory. If you are hired into a big company, I encourage you to be good troublemakers and to try to uh, question the status quo, look into other alternatives for materials, divert from polyester, divert from plastic at all costs. And yeah, I mean, it's a work in progress. Like I said, these are issues at several levels. So look, life is like an onion, essentially. There's so many layers and we can't just come up with one blanket statement that's going to solve it all. It's an all of the above kind of solution that we're looking for and kind of approach. So I want to thank you all for this amazing class and amazing participation. You all get A plus for participating into my class and do look into the resources that we shared that we're going to be sharing also uh, by email later on. And thank you so much for your support. If you do share the content, please tag Slow Factory, use the hashtag waste study. I just want to see what you do with it. We want to look into it and, and share the work with you and, and you know, be with you on this journey. So thank you so, so much and see you soon. <laughs>